Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Libor Mahalik to the Reboot Chronicles. He is the president of a firm, the leading payment network that helps merchants drive growth and provides consumers with some purchase optionality. You know, American consumers spend anywhere close to a trillion dollars a year or have a trillion dollars a year in outstanding credit card debt, depending on how you measure it. And with the rapid growth of buy now, pay later offered at almost every merchant category now, from furniture to flights to food, a firm is becoming a systemic part of the merchant and consumer transaction ecosystem. With a $15.5 billion funding capacity, the company has over 50 million consumers that have come onto the platform that generated $7.5 billion in gross merchandise value through their 277,000 partners and counting. And that delivered them about $1.6 billion in total annual revenue in their last fiscal year. So pretty exciting stuff. Libor, it's good to see you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you for having me. Um, Really uh, excited to be here and talk about a firm and and what we've been up to. Yeah, you got a great story, um, as everyone knows. And there's always two sides to the story. You know, no one likes to hear that... uh, (laughs) Um, Americans, North Americans have a trillion dollars in credit card debt, but we we can get into that. I just (laughs) love that um, as a Silicon Valley guy, ran a lot of companies out there, lived right near you. Just, um, you know, I I just love the way the platform took off and you got such a massive share of this buy now, um, pay later marketplace. You know, how did this just come about? I mean, did it just grow like crazy and everything was right or were there, were there a lot of reboots along the way? Um, there were, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's building a company and, and, and growing a company is certainly, I, th- I don't think it's any surprises challenging and there's plenty of challenges along the way, um, as, as we, as we scaled to where we are today, but, yeah. uh, you know, the, the mission and, and the idea ha- and the, and then ultimately the strategy, um, of, you know, the mission of building honest financial products that improve people's lives and then the strategy for how we think about building those products, delivering credit on a per purchase basis aligned with the interests of the customer and how we thought about scaling that out. That that's been really consistent throughout. And so of course, you know, there's, there's no shortage of hiccups um, and, and roadblocks uh, as you're going down that journey. But one of the things is um, that that's been helpful is having that North star and having that vision um, to stay true to and, and continuing to execute against it. Yeah. Yeah. Patient investors and funding obviously helps there a lot, but I'm always struck by, um, we can get into your business model in a minute, but just, uh, you know, why are, why didn't the big dog banks do this? First of all, why aren't they at the center of this and owning it? You know, they've got things like Zelle, you know, the nine of them, we, we can talk about peer to peer later, but, uh, it's, it's, it's just remarkable that um, it took a little startup to, um, to create a whole new category that, quite frankly, layaway was back in the old Sears yeah. catalog days. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost 100%. like a retro. 100%. I mean, it is, some of it is uh, back to the future uh, in the sense that it was really something that is like, how do you take a credit back to the, 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 the core principles, right? Of like, there's things that are more valuable to have now than 12 months from now. And you're willing to pay some extra money to have that mattress, that couch, that suit for, for an interview like today versus, um, you know, waiting for it for 12 months. And, you yeah. know, that, that is kind of what we went back to. There was really, you know, part of the, part of the inception was, found, you know, was rooted in, in really four technologies kind of occurring at roughly contemporaneously at the same time that enabled it. Um, you know, the, 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 the shift to e-commerce, the, um, you know, mob- the rise of mobile, um, really good machine learning and modeling and access to data, real-time access to consumer right. data, d- data about consumers, kind of those things all being available roughly, you know, uh, 15-ish years ago, um, really enabled us to th- say, okay, with these capabilities, how do we offer this product? And, and then being able to do so and 
being able to underwrite the individual and the purchase in real time at the point of sale, and then being able to give them clear terms, clear uh, understanding of this is what it's going to cost you all in as a part of the decision process, um, yep. as a part of the bill, right, uh, that they're being presented, and then then deciding, okay, this is worth it to me, or this is not worth it to me, and right. you know, being able to then deliver on that promise. So that's that's really kind of wh- where we started, what we've been doing ever since. As for, I think there's a, so I think there's a few things that are stood in the way of the big banks being able to do that, um, at least initially. Part of it is the business model and, 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 ju- and just the approach to the consumers, right? Credit cards are r- largely premised and making m- the bulk of their profits when the unexpected or unwanted happens. You know, they sell ubiquity and convenience, but the money comes from, m- events that nobody thinks is going to happen. Nobody thinks I'm just going to start revolt. You know, I'm going to not pay my uh, full <laughs> bill and then I'm going to start paying interest on everything that I do. Right. Um, that's not right. how people enter it, but that's where it's got where a 1960s so, connotation to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea of, you know, the banks entering into a product that's going to cannibalize credit cards, um, but with a lower margin, uh, you know, lower revenue for them uh, product, I think it posed challenges. But then there's also structural technological elements of the card networks, the kind of information that they are able to provide the, yep. uh, on a per transaction basis really preclude, uh, precluded the, the large providers from being able to provide that per purchase decision making capability and, and underwriting in the moment in real time really focusing on creating the the concept of the line of credit and a structure where they're underwritten once a year, once every other year for a certain amount, and that that's what follows user. Well, we realize that we can get much higher fidelity in terms of not just underwriting and understanding whether the consumer can or can't pay us back on this purchase, but also how to price it, right? Can we offer 0%? Is it an interest-bearing is it for the full amount? Is it for a part of the amount? All of those became uh, unlocks to being able to underwrite uh, more users and, and support a larger user base than you can when you're underwriting a credit card on a you know multi-year time horizon. Yeah, I mean you're being very polite to the uh, you know both the issue, you know that Visa Mastercard. I wasn't, that, that I wasn't probably, trying to be. <laughs> they're probably going to be on soon, and a couple of the big banks are are as well, but. You know, even Zell, the CEO of Zell is going to be on. We'll talk about it in a second. But what I love about what you just said in your platform is it's it's simplicity. So if I'm buying a you know expensive ticket on United or American, it's just hey, it's forty three bucks a month. I never add up times how many months and see how much you're making in there. I've never done that, but um, but I love the way it's just on demand, real time. It's very transparent. But in another way, you kind of democratize the decision with by being a you know, very kind of, you know, allow the consumer to kind of take control and say, hey, I could do this. Does it also help the, the um, I'll just call them merchants, but there's all types in your categories to, uh, I don't know, cross, sell, upsell, get a bigger shopping basket? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's part of the, that's part of the proposition is that because not just the underwriting, not just the feedback to the consumer, but the pricing itself is happening in real time. And so, to the extent of that the merchant is interested um, and, and capable of providing um, some of the some of that pricing, um, right. thereby buying down the customer's interest, um, buying down some of the risk, and allowing for larger amounts of exposure. Um, that is what we can pass on to the consumer, and that's why we have a fairly large share of um, you know zero percent offerings across our merchant base where some of them go out to two three years a lot of that pricing of being able to offer zero percent um, to, to the consumer for that period of time is um, you know the, the merchant not just you know not, not using a firm's analytical tools and those capabilities to really understand that hey, the amount of incremental revenue and sales I'm going to get as a result of offering zero percent is going to, you know, is going to be far outweigh the cost of doing that, and, and I, I, that's a that's right. a, something that you know a lot of more and more merchants are able to um, do through the platform. Yeah, the um, it's it's um, it's interesting. The um, 
I, I'm just thinking about other categories like big ones. So you, you said 0%. It triggered me for, you know, cars, you know, occasionally when mm-hmm. things get tight, the 0% offers come on. Do you see yourself getting into bigger and bigger ticket items like that someday? We do up to a point. I mean, I think right now what we're actually focused on is smaller items um, and yeah. being being able to satisfy a larger share of consumers' purchases by be, making sure we're available everywhere that they're, uh, you know, that consumers shop. So focusing on building uh, a direct to consumer product through the Affirm card, which is just taking this concept and, and applying it to um, what is a debit card, where you can decide um, in flow whether you want to pay for something now or whether you want to pay for over time and still use the same instrument to, to achieve that. That really um, starts to unlock things like. Um, offline, which is obviously a huge category. It makes that offline shopping experience much easier, much smoother. And so that's a big focus. Um, And as a part of that is really covering the broader, the breadth of smaller purchases for consumers. Um, But yeah, we do, we we do also talk about uh, going up, up the, up the purchase size towards larger, larger purchases. So many places you could go and your, your wheelhouse has always been e-com. Those of you that haven't used them yet. Um, but I see, yeah, I see you going into brick and mortar. I know you've been playing with it with Walmart and some others. And, and, um, is that, is that why you got into the credit card business today? You have like, I think about almost 800,000 cards out there. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually not a credit card. It's a credit card competitor. It's a debit card that allows uh, a per purchase, um, ah, gotcha. uh, decider decision of, I want this specific purchase to be paid over time. And again, the customer is deciding um, this is how much it's going to cost me all right. in before they make the purchase. So still keeping that value proposition, that um, user experience that customers um, you know, provide us so with that they really like, but doing it on a card, phys- on yeah. a physical card. So if I'm in Walmart looking at a big screen, I can just go to the app and it, yeah. you'll say, hey, it's 62 bucks a month. You know, great. So that rather than going to the cashier and causing a long yeah, line yeah. exactly <laughs> and then you get the barcode and you just scan it at the kiosk and you're on your way ah uh, got it got it got it got it and um last thing on the business model because not everyone understands so you know you get paid by the merchants and the consumers do you see that skewing one way or the, uh, or the other over the next you know five years or so going more towards the the merchant side because you really are enabling them to, but at the same time you're taking a consumer risk yeah, we, we, you know, there is also some risk on the merchant side, especially small merchants. There's, uh, there's the consumer risk, consumers paying. You know, I, I think that's a that's a function of both, you know, both the macroeconomic environment, which, uh, you know, I, I'm no longer uh, trying to guess where that's going to go. Um, just running the business uh, independent of wherever it goes and making sure we have a healthy business. Um, sure. As well as the merchant base, um, you know, a lot of it is also driven. You, you said it earlier, based on their calendar and when they want to see uh, more sales, larger sales, and and what's motivating them. So, you know, our our goal isn't for any specific balance of merchants paying versus consumers paying. It's really is of of trying to bring them together and and create the uh, you know the most um, you know exchange of value that we can provide um, across both of them. So they both feel like they're getting something great out of the, out of that transaction. Looking at your innovation uh, pipeline, just back to that. So we've had a couple of the uh, new emerging banks on, you know, the ones that have been extremely well-funded and have their own credit card, but it's mostly for small business, SMB, mm-hmm. not consumer. Do, what do you think of the, is the SMB ever a category for you guys? Yes. For sure, um, we've actually started uh, a pilot, some pilot programs with both Amazon and Best Buy around small businesses, starting oh, with sole propositions for their and merchants. So, sure. yeah. yeah, and that's that's where we've started, largely because it's a it's a you know it's a customer base that we understand in the sense of we obviously see them on the merchant side already. Um, and to a large extent, you know, how they're funded and how they operate, they, they look a lot like a sole prop business looks a lot like a consumer. And so a lot of our modeling, our tooling, all of that fits in. And so that was kind of the natural extension for us. But it's, you know, that, that is just uh, a, a path on the progression towards 
um, you know, towards sole prop uh, from sole props to you know, you know lim- limited so, liabilities. Sole proprietors, that's what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 sole proprietors. Thank you. Huh. So, sorry to be digging into your pipeline so much, yeah. but you know, we're we're trying to get a Happy. understanding of what makes you guys tick, how you think. So, so what about I mentioned Zell or however you pronounce it again, the nine big dog banks um, funding that the peer to peer transactions is. What do you think of that area? Um, I think it's, a, it's certainly an in, uh, interesting area and an area that has um, you know, obviously, like you said, a lot of participants in it. You know, I think it's it's not something that is on the immediate roadmap. We're really thinking about how uh, yep. to bring consumers and merchants together, um, how to actually, you know, create more value for consumers when dealing with merchants and obviously merchants uh, having the value of more customers that, you know, that bring, bring having that level playing field of consumer to consumer. I think it's an yeah. area that is, uh, we'll explore, but I think it's uh, probably a little further out than things like your, you know, your previous questions about small businesses. Uh, yeah. Cause I mean, you know, I'd love to like sell my boat or a couple of jet skis and just tell the guy, Hey, just, you know, scan it. And then it comes up, so it's hundred bucks a month. The guy's like, Oh, I can do this. <laughs> it takes the, <laughs> it takes the negotiation off the $20,000 thing. It breaks it yeah, down yeah. monthly. I, don't, I think everyone's yeah, missing yeah. the boat on that one. Or maybe I, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they offer that. I just did. I have never seen it. Yeah, I, it's it's a it's definitely trickier. I think there. I, I, I like you say. I think there's yeah. is a real opportunity there. I think it's more a matter like any any business, right? We have to uh, decide what order we're going to take things in, and and you know do our best. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, there's as much uh, as we can. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, there's like one point six billion independent freelance contractors or however you want to call them around the globe and it's just uh yeah it's always like available cash moving to available cash mode versus this kind of an idea it's just making me think a lot but um but let's go back to your current stuff so you you guys are doing an amazing job uh one of the reasons i wanted to have you on is on partnerships so partnerships at reboot we think that is a key to massively accelerating companies and companies that don't move as quick or grow as fast as you have just don't do them so you've you know you've, you've named the big ones obviously you know amazon walmart target um major retailers major e-com providers all the way down to the little guys that are mm-hmm. you know on the exchanges on walmart exchange probably kroger probably and so what can you teach um you know listeners here about partnering great question and you know we also partner with uh shopify is another one that we were excited mm. about and i, I mentioned them because how could I leave out? One I mentioned them because, <laughs> yeah, I mentioned them because they, they are actually are, uh, you know, a, a really good example of what does it mean to work with a partner and work well with a partner. And they were and your think, initial, they were your initial big push, right? They were, they were one of, they, they were definitely one of them. Yeah. One of the partner pushers. I think we had Walmart before them. Um, oh, you did. Shop, okay. Yeah, yeah. Shopify was certainly, um, you know, it taught us a lot about partnering, and it, it was it was really interesting. It kind of gets to your question, which is, in some ways, the things that we were already doing, we realized through the experience of working with Shopify how valuable those things were to an organization, to a partner like Shopify. It's re- where it is really about um, working collaboratively with the other engineering team to the point where. You have your team of product people and designers and engineers, and you have theirs, and it starts to feel like one combined team. And that, I feel like, is when it's going really well, is when you feel like you're in it together, shared right. goals, trying to drive the shared outcome. But, but in a really importantly, shared sense of urgency, say, shared sense of pace of how are we doing this together. So trying to remove a lot of things. A lot of times you see partner organizations where one partner just has a very different methodology to how they approach working and building. And it creates this impedance mismatch on pace and rigor and quality that can really create friction, not just in terms of how fast you're able to move, um, but also in terms of what it is that you value in delivering software in delivering outcomes and products. And so I think that becomes really important is really is is that understanding of what does your partner care about? How do they work? How does how do their teams operate? 
and work and putting in the time and effort to try to match them um, on what it is that they're doing and, and being a part of their team uh, as much yeah. as um, being advice. an independent organization. Yeah, I often tell, depends who I'm talking to, if it's the small company, I'd say I'm telling one thing, but if it's the big dog, I usually say, hey, listen, whatever they've asked for, give them more. Give the little company more, especially when you're first starting out, because they need it. They need the momentum. Mm -hmm. Don't get that last percentage. <laughs> this is not worth it. Yeah. Make them yeah. a partner, not a, you know, not a vendor. The, um, That's that, great advice. Um, a lot of people listening in, you know, that $1 trillion in credit card debt throws people into a tizzy sometimes. So. <laughs> What do you say to the uh, the press that you know it goes around about how this you know buy now pay later is just making it worse for people getting more and more into debt? It's a I mean it's a good question. I mean I, I and I think it there is reason re, you know it is reasonable to be concerned about the in level of indebtedness of the consumer. Um, I think that's especially true in term in credit card debt. As it relates to revolving debt, right? Where purchases, you, you know, you take your credit card, you're revolving on it because you bought a TV two years ago, and you know you're you're buying lattes and groceries and being charged interest on them because it's all in the same line. Um, and so, I, you know, from our perspective, it has always been a view that there are purchases that are larger and relative to a person's, uh, you know, monthly or biweekly cash flow where there is value in having that uh, item today um, versus later. And how do you provide access to credit in a way that the customer can make that decision? Yeah. They, how can we help them understand how much is this going to cost to have it today versus spending the next 12 months saving for it and then buying it? And is that worth it to you? And part of that value has always been, the thing we show the customer, it will never cost more than the number we show. We don't charge lay fees. We don't compound interest past what we showed you, even if you're delayed in your payments. Um, it, you know, it doesn't obviously revolve. It's closed-ended. And so we, we approached it from a credit is necessary. Credit is something and, and debt is necessary for people to be able to, you know, create leverage in their own lives, the way businesses and, right. and organizations right. do. And how do you do that in a way that is uh, responsible? How do you do that in a way that is understandable to, you know, a typical consumer and that doesn't get them in trouble? And so, you know, there's a large amount of credit card revolving debt out there. Um, we'd like to see that, you know, revolving debt certainly, um, um, you're definitely more. Exactly. You're definitely more down. friendly. You're more friendly than some credit card companies. I know that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys must have some. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So, if I'm on, you know, a site buying a couch, and another person's on exact same couch, exact same time of day, night, are we going to get the same rate, or do you actually have enough intel on each of us to change the rates? We have enough uh, information to change the rates. Yes, yes with that. Okay. Uh, each and actually, each person even purchase to purchase uh, will see different rates. Uh, not definitive, not definitely, but there's a you yeah. know, especially once a customer starts paying us back, and we can see more of that interaction history between us and the customer. Um, yeah. They will see improvements in rates over time. Yeah, yeah. I know some of the airlines are using it to. You know, get people to make decisions because a lot of times yeah, there's yeah. the hang up, there's a hang up right there. But mm -hmm. so how does um, you know, without getting too geeky here in your product line stuff, but does AI make this better for you or worse in the future? Because you guys have been doing AI for a long time, you're one of the early ones that we've worked with. What um, where, where do you see this going? Um. I mean, I think like any technology that, that, and especially sort of large, you know, large in the sense of big change technologies, you know, they they always have their positives and negatives. You know, it's people behind it at the end of the day, and you know, because people have positives and negatives, you get that, you know, that flows through the technology. So, you know, on the one hand, we worry about large language models uh, um, usage in fraud, and that's an area of investment for us is how to detect, you know, fraud that's being driven by, um, you know, and especially account takeover and things like that through large language models. On the other side, you know, uh, the flip side, there's a lot of potential benefits around, especially around user education and understanding and putting it into words and terms and, and uh, that customers understand about 
what's happening, how, why are these decisions happening, how does the product work, you know, support and servicing. Uh, so there's a large amount of opportunity there. I think from the perspective of the actual modeling we do on credit, that is an area where we're very focused on, yes, we use um, uh, modeling to come up with our results for yeah, our credit decision and our pricing, but they are sort of strictly deterministic. This is an area where we feel pretty strongly, um, even though the, you know, even though one purchase might versus another purchase might have different pricing based on things like the merchant subsidizing some of the risk. The way we got to that answer is deterministic. And it's something that we think is really important is to be able to make it explainable, understandable, and repeatable. Um, obviously something that uh, large language models by design are not intended to do. And so that those for us are in a different domain of how we think about um, leveraging them for the business outside of the credit decision. Yeah, that's why I asked. I think you, I don't know, in a way are way ahead of the market just with your own uh, algorithms. Let's talk about some fun stuff uh, without getting going. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you keep this all going? What's the, you know, when you look at growth and innovation, you know, you can build stuff inside, you can partner and borrow it, you can acquire things, you know, how, how do you kind of look at that? And you know, what's your, what's your innovation culture like? Um, great question. I mean, I think that, that, acquisition partner build uh, is, you know, part of that question for us is always how close is it to the center of what we do? You know, I think as we think about, well, is it, it's not really exactly. a core capability. It's something that we're not necessarily need to be experts in. We really aggressively look at partnering, buying um, solutions there and, and, and incorporating them. As you get closer to the center of what you do and really the core differentiator, not only is it an area where we uh, continue to invest in order to be able to continue to learn and be able to deliver value, you know, when you think about it also, because it is the core of what you do, it's also something that's harder to integrate into or replace because it is the, it, it has the, the, the sort of the most active surface area of development, of investigation, of experimentation. And so it makes it, it, that activity makes it actually difficult to just bring something in from the outside and just jam it into the center of what you do versus as you get kind of further out to the outer edges of the onion, you know, bringing in, um, you know, a CRM or, or, or some other capability yeah. has much more definitive and, and limited surface area in terms of how it plugs into your product. And so that also helps to answer the, you know, the question of, should we build it or should we buy it? Should we partner? Or should we continue to innovate? Yeah. Great answer, by the way. Uh, a lot of people struggle with that <laughs> with the question because it's, uh, you, it's too much going on out there. You can't just, uh, I know other companies have built everything themselves. There's you know, billion dollar companies going to be on the week before you and can't argue with their approach, man. It's worked well. You know, uh, Libor, I really want to appreciate you, you know, being on and what, um, Tell us about yourself. You know, if you had a personal challenge, a struggle in your life that you've overcome that uh, got you to where you are now? I think. We call it a know, reboot. I, I, so Sorry, I didn't mean to use hard <laughs> words like challenge. But yeah, have you rebooted yourself over the years? You know, I, I think for me, I, I started out my career um, very in, as an engineer. I, I, I got my computer science degree from University of Illinois, which is actually where I met our, uh, you know, no, it will. CEO yeah. at a firm, and so I, I started out as a, you know, diehard um, building software, um, everything from supercomputing to uh, you know to software for other engineers, tools, uh, all of that. And the first three startups I worked on were all for me very focused on the technology and uh, how, how we can, how we can build better software and how we can deliver results through building software. I think it was it was after those three startups where for me a reboot was around the getting very interested in the product and the business itself and understanding that larger, for me, larger systems problems of how people come together to deliver products to solve business outcomes and, and how that works. And so that has been really interesting in how I've stayed very engaged as sort of moving mm -hmm. yep. more into a uh, business operating role uh, that spans not just engineering, but, but kind of the whole, the whole enchilada. Yes. Yeah, so how'd, you, how'd you learn the rest of it? Was it by doing? 
I think it's by doing. I think that's the best way to learn. You know, you bring your skills uh, with you. So you have to have skills that uh, matter to what's happening, but um, they also create, those skills also create the opportunity to get involved in everything that those skills touch and, and learn about those areas and, and understand them. That and surrounding yourself with smart people that you enjoy working with. Yeah, amen on that. The um, If I went down to U of I, which I've been down there, I've taught there and done a couple of speeches, what, um, or maybe if you went down there, what would you tell students to focus on before they graduate to, so they're better prepared? I'd probably be talking to computer science students. You know, <laughs> I think actually anything, maybe. any kind of student that I'd be talking to, you know, it is, it really is find the things that you, you know, make sure the thing you're working on in, in terms of skill sets and capabilities are the things that gen- you're genuinely interested in. You have to have that interest to sustain your attention span because the o- the only way right to to succeed is to become good at that skill and the only way to go be good at a skill is to do it a lot and the only way to do it a lot is if it's actually something that you enjoy doing and that that is fun and that is that feels productive to you and so that that's what i would tell them i, w- I would tell them you know make sure it's fun and prepare yourself for doing a lot of it over the next call it five to ten I years like it. Uh, as, as you as you get better Good advice. That seems to be missing a lot in jobs and companies is the, the passion. So thanks. Thanks for your thanks for your input. You've been listening to Libor Mahalik. He is the president of a firm. This is Dean Tobias with the Reboot Chronicles. I want to thank you for joining us today. We'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.